Y'all sounded really good for a Sunday morning. Y'all must be up and ready to go and ready for church to start. You sounded amazing, and it was just, it was just fun, especially that song. I really enjoyed that song. I want to welcome you to the lake. If it's your first time with us, my name is Ronnie. I'm the lead pastor here, and we're in this, uh, I don't want to call it a series, but it's kind of in a study that we're calling Essential Truths. We're looking at these foundational truths that every believer ought to know. Not that we've heard about or we've thought about, but we all ought to know this. We really ought to know these things. And two weeks ago when we started, we talked about the Bible, that this is God's Word. That when we looked in the Bible, we could find all the, the scientific accuracy and all the historic accuracy that's contained within these pages. We also found out that from Genesis to Revelation, there is a unified theme all the way through this Bible, and it's God's redemption of man. All the way through the Bible. And that through this book, that they can tra- the, the words in this book can transform a life and change someone's life. I even ask how many people's lives have been changed by the words out of this book when someone shared the gospel by reading this book. Last week we talked about how that transformation, this change in our life, can't be taken away from us. No matter what happens, we cannot lose that grip of God's grace. That we believe and accept that God's grace through Jesus' death and resurrection. And now we have an eternal salvation. We can be assured of that salvation. And that there are birthmarks in our life of that salvation. That we are spending our time in the Bible, leading, letting it lead us and guide us how we should live our lives. That we are loving one another with no holes barred. We, 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 just, we just love one another and care for one another. And that we live a life as a follower of Jesus to where people see that in our life that something has changed. And even though we're assured of a salvation with God, and even though we believe this book right here is true and accurate, we're still human. We still make mistakes. I mean, we were born with sin, and if we're born with sin, then we're bound to sin. It's going to happen. And if we're bound to sin, then we're bound to suffer for that sin because suffering follows sin just like night follows day. So I have a question for us today as we want to to find out some of these essential truths in our life. This is our question for today. What happens when a Christian sins? What happens when we as followers of Jesus, as Christians, sin? And is there a difference between believers who sin and non-believers who sin? Just to let you know, there is a little difference. A non-believer, when a non-believer sins, they don't know they've done anything wrong because they don't know of anything being wrong in their life, so they haven't done anything wrong. But a believer, a believer knows that they've made a mistake. A believer knows that they've sinned. And a believer also knows that no one is immune Say, hey, I know you're, I'm back. So I don't know that spot right there. But uh, there's, there's this, where was I at? Okay. It just threw me off there. No one's exempt from this sin. No one except God's son. He never sinned. He was sinless. I mean, when you look at, we can look through this Bible. It's accurate and historically accurate as it is. And we can look at all the godly people in this Bible. And we can find that even kings... Kings are handpicked by God, still sin, especially King David. King David committed a terrible sin, a heinous sin, and he's a child of God. He was, as is recorded in the scriptures, he's a man after God's own heart. But he sinned. And then he wrote about it. He wrote about all of it in, in Psalm 51. We call it, I think we would call that uh, psalm the, the consequences of sin because he shared about the consequences of sin in his life. And when we read this, it tells us the consequences of sin in our life as a believer because this is what happens when a, when a Christian sins. And this is what he says in Psalm 51. Starting at the very beginning, he says, Have mercy on me, O God. According to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. I'm dirty. So what we learn just in the first verses from Psalm 51 is David is telling us that sin dirties the soul. It covers us in dirt. And if we don't, if we don't feel dirty when we sin, then we have to ask ourselves, am I truly saved? 
Because a Christian should feel. A, a, a child of God realizes that they're dirty. They realize it unless, unless they've never been clean. It's like you, ne- you never hear a pig fussing about being muddy and dirty. They don't, I mean, because they don't know what it's like to be clean. So muddy and dirty is just their life. It's, they're in their element. It doesn't, it doesn't make any difference to them. And if we, if we constantly sin, if we constantly make mistakes and don't change from that, and eventually we'll become accustomed to the dirt as well, and we won't see the sin in our lives anymore. But David knows. David knows he's dirty. He even says it in the very next verse. In verse 3, he says, For I know my transgressions. I know I'm dirty. And my sin is ever before me. I'm so dirty, I can't get rid of it. It's what he's talking about is that the sin that's happening, it dominates the mind. The sin that David has done has burned, has etched itself in his mind, and he can't get rid of it. He can't shake it off. No matter what he tries to do, that sin stays right there in his mind. It dominates all of his thoughts. Now, we may think that that doesn't happen in our lives, that we don't, when we do something sin, it, it, it doesn't, it always, we don't always think about it, that it doesn't dominate all of our thoughts. It doesn't dominate our mind. It just, it just sort of comes and goes, but it, it'll show up because it stays there. It remains there. It'll, it'll, maybe it'll show up in, our, in a fit of rage, in, in our anger, in, our, in, our, in a short fuse in our temper. Our, our, the sin will, will come out. Or maybe it'll come in when we're, we're, we have an inability to uh, concentrate on something and we get irritated. Or when we have a, a lack of joy or we have a, a sleepless night that we can't get any sleep at all because of something that we've done. It just won't let us take that time to rest. See, a real test to know if you're saved, that you're a child of God, is not if you sin. But it's if you sin and you ignore it. If, if, you're, if you're really saved, you can't ignore it. I mean, if, if you're saved as a child of God, if you sin, you cannot ignore it. The Holy Spirit living inside of you won't allow it. It does like, if, have you ever had those pressure points and had somebody hit a pressure point and, and put their thumb right on, right on that muscle? Well, that's what the Holy Spirit does. It finds that sore spot. It finds that mistake that you made that you're trying to get rid of and try not to think about. And he pushes his thumb. And he just drives it in. And it's what it's called. It's called conviction. It's telling you, yeah, you've done something wrong. You know it. You're dirty. You know it. You know you've made a mistake. And I'm not going to let you forget about it. And just presses down because it's, it's not the sin that it's wanting us to think about. It's who we've sinned against. It's who we have sinned against. David knows this. And he shared this in verse 4. He says, against you, you only have I sinned. God, it's you. I've sinned against you. And I've done what is evil in your sight. So that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. I I did this to you, so I'm, I'm ready for what's coming. I'm ready for the consequences. I know that they're coming. But notice that David doesn't mention the impact his sin has on his marriage. He doesn't mention the impact his sin has on his family. He doesn't even talk about the impact his sin had on the nation of Israel. He's focused on who he sinned against. To David and to a believer, sin disgraces the Lord. It just flat is. And this was so painful for David because David loved the Lord. He's a man after God's own heart. He was handpicked by God. But he's broken God's heart by what he's done. And he knows it. He also knows that God saw it. It says there in the verses that I've done what is evil in your sight. Whatever we do, whatever we say, whatever we think, it's not hidden from God. It's not a secret. There are no secrets with God. He knows everything. He's witnessed it all. And when David thinks about that, and we think about the sin in our lives, we need to understand that, God, I've sinned against you. We can know that we're saved. We can know that we're a child of God when the disappointing our father hurts more than the punishment. Do you ever have those conversations with your parents? And you can see it in their eye that you disappointed daddy, that you disappointed mama. And they could whip you, they could spank you, they could ground you, they could take your keys. But just that look in their eye, that was painful enough, especially if you love them. This is what David is dealing with. He's disgraced the Lord. This sin has brought disgrace not to David, but to the Lord. 
And when you start thinking about that, when David started thinking about this, sin depresses the heart. It depresses the heart. I mean, it, it takes all the joy away of life. It, it, David, David's a king that sings and dances, but he's talking about how this sin now has depressed him. Look what he says in, in verse 8. He says, let me hear joy and gladness because I don't hear it anymore. It's missing. This sin has taken that away. And then in verse 12, he says this. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. There's there's no joy. David has no joy. He has no gladness. Serving the Lord. In his whole life, he served the Lord. You read about him as a teenage shepherd boy. You read about him against Goliath. You read about his growing up under Saul and being part of Saul's army and being part of Saul's staff. and becoming. He served the Lord with gladness. It's in his psalms. But now there's no joy and there's no gladness. The sin is taken out of the way. There's no more music. David used to write songs, but he doesn't write anymore. David used to sing praises to God, but he doesn't sing anymore. There's no joy. This joy leads to depression. And if depression is not checked, then it leads to illness. We become ill from this depression. He even mentions that back in verse 8. He says, let me hear joy and gladness because it's missing. I'm, I'm, I'm depressed let the bones that you have broken rejoice, which is hard for us to read. What do what now? You you want to? We broken some bones and we, no. See, like David, when when a person is under psychological and spiritual pressure because of sin, it affects the body. It's called psychosomatic illness. It's where your mind convinces you that you're sick. It's where your mind convinces you that you're tired. It's where your mind convinces you you're depressed and no one loves you and no one cares about you. When you're spiritually pressured by your sin, when this pressure comes on you because of the sin, then this sin, what, what David's trying to say, this sin diseases the body. It starts to eat away at us. It starts to drain us of all of our strength, all of our joy, all of our hope. It makes the body sick. Sin in our life as a believer, without any repentance, if we sin with no repentance, we ignore it, we try to forget it, it can actually make us physically sick and actually make us feel like our bones are broken. Our joints are aching, the bones are broken, we're out of sorts. Have you ever said, have you ever uttered these words, uh, I feel, I just feel crushed. Like because you did something or the way someone responded or something happened, you just, I just, you're, you're not crushed. I mean, you, didn't, you didn't get physically hurt, but you just feel, you just feel crushed like the weight of everything is on you and it's crushing you. See, sometimes when we make a mistake, sometimes when we sin as a follower of Jesus, we think that God turns his back on us, that God just tosses us over to the side and walks away from us and just allows the suffering and the hurt and the pain to fall on us. That's how people respond. They think, well, God's not lo- God doesn't love me anymore. God doesn't care, so that's why I'm going through this. No, that's not it. What you've got to understand, the truth is that God loves you too much. He loves you so much that when he sees you making a mistake, and he knows where this mistake is going to lead you, and he knows what Satan is trying to do to you, he's going to grab a hold of you, and he's going to draw you even closer than you were before. He's actually going to tighten his grip on you. So tight, as David says, it feels like he's broken his bones. And wants, a, wants them to rejoice again. You know, I, I want to understand why this is going on. See, God will never let us go. We learned that last week that when God's hand of grace reaches down to our hand of faith, there's no breaking that grip. And we hold on to that. And God's not going to, no matter what happened. And Satan's going to try to pull us away. And God's grip's going to get tighter. Can you imagine it getting tighter? And when he's trying to pull us, God's going to wrap his arms around it and squeeze us even tighter. And it's going to feel like you're crushing me, God. But yes, I'm going to hold you and I'm not going to let you go. So, and, and this is and David's trying to, he's trying to go through this and, and, and figure all this, the consequences of these sin. That it's, it's actually, God is trying to help me even though the sin feels like it's destroying me. This is what happens in the mind of a, a, a Christian, a follower of Jesus. When we sin, we, when there's so much a struggle. David even says in verse 10, he says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Because when God is crushing us, when God is pulling us closer, that's proof that we're his child. But we still don't believe that God loves us that much because we're out of fellowship with God. We've made a mistake and we've walked away and it feels like maybe God's not watching us. No, we're completely wrong on that. He's drawing us closer. And what it's done, this disease, this sin that gets in our mind and starts depressing our heart, it defiles the spirit. 
that's inside of us. God has given us a spirit of joy and a spirit of love and a spirit of excitement and stuff. And now it's all being crushed. Now it's all being stru- and, it, and it defiles the spirit. What happened was David is out of fellowship with God. He says, I want to get, give me a clean heart. Get me back because I feel like we're not even connecting. I'm not even talking to you anymore. He's, he's got this point where he sees everybody else's mistakes, but he doesn't recognize his because he's been, it's, it's been dealing with it so long. He's look, it's starting to affect the way he sees everybody else. When someone's out of fellowship with God, they start seeing the faults and mistakes in everyone else. And the prophet in the Old Testament, the prophet Nathan comes to David. And he says, David, you're, you're reacting wrong. There's something that he knows that God has told Nathan, this is what David did. You need to straighten him out. So Nathan tells a parable. He says, David, here in your kingdom, in this vast kingdom, there's a gentleman down here. He owns, he owns a, a huge piece of property down there. He's got all kinds of cattle and all kinds of sheep. And on the corner of his property lives one of his servants. And his servant actually rescued a lamb that had got attacked. And they thought it was going to die, but he took care of it he nursed it back to health and he nourished it and now this lamb he loves this lamb so much it's like his child but then the owner of this big field has a guest to come and they want to have a feast so he goes to the servant's house and takes his lamb he brings his lamb and kills his lamb and serves it to his feast and David explodes because David sees the guilt and all the shame and all the ill and the sin and the wrong and what he did and David starts judging he judges someone who stole a lamb and killed it for a feast. Didn't even realize that he stole a wife and killed her husband to cover it. But Nathan brought it out to him. See, when people get out of sorts, when people fall out of fellowship with God, they complain about everything. They don't see their mistakes because it's become it's not dirty to them anymore. But they see everybody else's mistakes and they nitpick this, and they nitpick that. They'll even nitpick God. In his church, in the people in the church, in the Southern Baptist Church, that falling out of fellowship with God is called backsliders. You know, they just sort of backslide. They just sort of slip out of the way and they complain about everything. They complain about God. They have issues with everything. It has to do with the church at all. They find something wrong with everything. And every church has one or two all across the country. They're out there. They just, they don't have, it's just like they don't have anything else better to do but walk around and find some fault in somebody else. We have men, you know, in our lives. And I, was, I heard his pastor talk about that there was a gentleman in his church that was just like that. He would always, it was always too hot. It was always too cold. He didn't like this. He didn't like that. And then he came to church one day and was walking around the church just inspecting things just to see if he could find fault. And he found a closet, went to this closet, opened the door, and there were five new brooms in that closet. Five. Not one, but five. And he's like, how do we afford five new brooms? We can't even take up enough to, to pay our bills now. We're not meeting the budget now. So he goes and finds the secretary. How are we doing this? We got five new brooms and we can't even pay our bills. And she was trying to explain, but he didn't want to hear it. So he tracked down the pastor. All right, tell me, we got five new brooms in this closet and we can't afford it. And the pastor, well, well we were down at Sam's and they were on sale. And we do a lot of cleaning here, and it takes quite a few brooms, and we go through quite a few, so we got five. They'll last a little bit longer, we got five. And the guy storms out. He just doesn't understand it, that we're wasting our money on five brooms. And so he leaves, and the pastor walks by the secretary's office. He said, what? I don't understand. And she said, well, you need to look at it from his point of view. Just look at it from his point of view. How would you feel if all the money you gave for the entire year was spent on five brooms? <laughs> That's a good one, wasn't it? <laughs> Every once in a while, I find a good one. But see, don't we all have faults in our life? We all make mistakes. We all have faults. And sometimes we see others before we see ours. But what I've realized is that's why we're here. We're just a bunch of people with faults. A bunch of sinners that God has brought together through his grace to band together to make a difference as a body of believers. That's why God has brought us together. So you look at this, this sin in, in a Christian and what, it, what happens when a Christian sins and it, it dirties the mind and all and it, and it defiles the soul and defiles the spirit and it destroys the testimony. Sin will destroy the testimony. And this may be one of the worst consequences of sin in the life of a believer. 
This is how David addressed it in verse 14 and 15. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation. And my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. You ever, ever wonder why people don't sing in the worship? Why people don't participate, they don't sing out? It's because they got nothing to sing about. There's nothing to sing about. They can't, they can't worship or praise God because the sin in their life, the sin that's dominating their mind, the sin that's depressing their heart and defiling their soul seals their lips. And nothing can come out. They can't, they can't even tell somebody else about the goodness of God. They can't even tell somebody else about the love of God that they've experienced in their life. They can't, they can't do it because sin has sealed their lips. David even requested from God in verse 12 he made a request he said restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit then then I will teach transgressors their ways and sinners will return to you then I will do it I, I can't do it now because the sin is in my mind it's dominating my mind it's depressing me it's defiling my spirit I'm out of fellowship with you God and, and I can't tell anybody about you and he doesn't doesn't tell anybody about God and God's greatness and God's power and how God has blessed Israel. He doesn't do that. Do we see how what, what sin in the life of a, a believer does? Because when sin comes into a life, when we make a sin and, and we com- commit a sin, then there's no song in our life. There's, there's no praise in our life. There's no joy in our life. There's no fellowship in our life. Because the sin, it, it dirties our soul and it dominates the mind disgraces the Lord, depresses the heart, diseases the body, defiles the spirit, and destroys the testimony. And here we're reading it, we're reading about this in a psalm. And 150 psalms, they should be a lot of joy and praising because psalms is praising God, words of praise to God. But this is a downer, this is a downer psalm right here. When I'm looking at David, you just brought me down. If I'm reading all about the consequences of sin, it'll bring you down until, until we read Psalm 51 from another viewpoint. If we read Psalm 51 from the eyes of a child of God that has eternal salvation because they believe his book is true and accurate, this is what it says. It talks about the cleansing of sin. Not the consequences of sin, but the cleansing of sin that takes place in the life of a Christian. And how this cleansing can bring back the joy. This cleansing can bring back the song. This cleansing, cleansing can bring back the testimony. The first thing that we get when we read this, when we look at it through the eyes of a child of God, we find confidence. We find confidence. In in Psalm 51, starting at the very beginning, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. David knows what we need to know. He knew that and he wrote it down, that no matter what mistakes we make, God's mercy and steadfast love would never end. That he would always love us and have mercy for us. And that he even demonstrated. We know that he even demonstrated before we even were introduced to God. In Romans 8 it says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners and walking away from God, he showed his love for us to allowing his son to die on a cross for us. That's how much he loves us. We need this confidence that David had that, that God would always love him, and God would always show mercy, that God always loved that there's that there's nothing we can do to make him love us more. There's nothing we can do to make him love us less. That our sin may break his heart, but he still loves us with all of himself. This is what God does for us. So we have this confidence that God loves us, and with this confidence, that leads us to confession. That we can talk to God. David even says in, in verse 2, he says, Wash me thoroughly for my iniquity, my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. There, there's one thing that God will never accept about sin, and that's an alibi or an excuse for what we're doing. He will never accept that because Jesus didn't die for alibis. Jesus died for sin. To release us from that sin and rescue us from that sin. And we have to confess that. David doesn't doesn't blame it on anybody. He says, this is mine. This is my sin. This is my iniquity. I take ownership, God. Yes, I've done wrong. 
But people, people just want to blame somebody else all the time. They'll even blame God for the mistakes that happened in their life. You can look in the Bible, in Genesis. Adam commits a sin, and God comes to Adam to find out, why did you do this? Why did you, well, that, that woman you gave me, right? That's what he said, that woman you gave me. And then he goes to Eve and says, well, why did you say, well, that serpent, that serpent, and the poor serpent, he doesn't have a leg to stand on. <laughs> Bloom, tsh. I was on a roll there for a little while, right? <laughs> I was close. But see, our sinful, our sinful nature, it tries to make an excuse for all of our sin. We always try to cover up and make an excuse. It, they did it. They let. It was their fault. They, it w- wasn't me. I don't know how that happened. It, was, it wasn't me. In Proverbs 28, and I shared this with y'all uh, a couple of weeks ago. This is what it says. He who covers his sin means he who makes mis- excuses. He who has an alibi will not prosper. But whoever confesses. And forsakes them, forsakes the sin, will have mercy. We'll have this abundant mercy and this steadfast love that God offers. When we try to cover our sin and try to hide it, God always uncovers it. The scriptures will tell us there's nothing secret and will be hidden from God. He will uncover it. But when we uncover our sin, when we confess and admit and own our sin, God covers it. He cleanses us. He cleanses us. In the New Testament, it says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There's confidence, there's confession, and there's cleansing. And this cleansing is the cleansing power of God's grace. Remember, I shared this last week, that we are saved by the grace of God. And this free gift of grace from God saves us and cleanses us inside and out. Not just washes the outside, but inside and out. And David knew this. And David even said in verse 7, "Purge," he says, purge me, which is go deep within me. Purge me with hyssop. Now, hyssop might be just a strange word, but hyssop is part of a Jew, the Jewish Passover. It's a plant that was used by the Israelites in Egypt that when they sacrificed the lamb... On the day that the death angel was coming, they sacrificed the lamb and they took the hyssop plant and they dipped it in the blood and they painted the doorpost with the blood so the death angel would pass over them. Then they were released from Egypt to the promised land. And every Passover, they have a hyssop branch on the table to remind them that that was used to redeem them, to rescue them. It's also a reminder to us that Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, his blood redeems us from the sins that we find ourselves trapped in and that God's judgment would pass over us. This is what he's talking about. And he says, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean on the inside. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow so that people will notice the cleanliness on the outside. People can see the difference on the outside. Clean me on the inside and cleanse me on the outside. Isaiah said the same thing. Though your sins be, are, be like scarlet, they should be white as snow. That God will cleanse you. You know, um, when you have a really, ladies, when you have a really nice blouse, you just purchase a really nice blouse and you go out to eat and some steak sauce gets on it. Guys, the same thing. A brand new shirt, brand new suit or whatever and steak sauce or something gets on you and your first response is to, but you're not supposed to, you know. Your wife will just chew you out for that. Uh, but you, you try everything you possibly can to get that stain out. And, and, and you, may, you may work on it for days and put every, every little gain and shout and everything else you can think of, every, every home remedy, every wives' tale, whatever, to get that stain out. And, and, and it may, you may do a really good job and nobody really can notice it. But don't you know it's still there? You know exactly what you could pick it out from across the room. Yeah, I can say, I'm not wearing that. I can still see that stain. Well, it's the same thing in our lives. When we make mistakes, we try to do everything we humanly possibly can to cover it up, to try to clean it up ourselves, and it's still there. It won't go away. It gets, it gets, it gets embedded in the mind, and we, we see it. Every time someone thanks us or something, we say, well, I'm not that good. I've made this mistake. There's, there's only one way. There's only one way to cleanse yourself inside and out. Only one way. 1 John 1, 7 says that the blood of Jesus, his son, God's son, 
cleanses us from all sin. Meaning that there is no stain of sin the blood of Jesus cannot remove. None. So you can't say, well, I don't think he'd forgive me for that. Yeah, he would. I don't think God would forgive me. For, yes, he would. I, don't think, I think God will hold that over my head. No, he not. He washes that white as snow. It's purged with hyssop, with the sacrifice of Jesus. You are clean on the inside and out. There is no stain. So you see, when we're a child of God, when we sin, we, we know we're dirty. We know we made a mistake. We, we can feel it on us. It's just not, it's not supposed to be there. But we know we can be cleansed, that God will clean us of that sin inside and out. But he doesn't just clean us so we can sit there and be clean. And just say, okay, good, I'm clean now. No, he cleanses us, meaning that he sets us apart for his glory. He does this so that we would continue to do what we're supposed to be doing, what we've been called to do. And when he, when he does that, it's called consecration. This is because your life has been consecrated. You've been rescued. You've been clean. And now you need to continue what you were doing. You were on the right path. You fell off because you're a child of mine. I've brought you back and I've cleansed you from the inside out. And now I want to continue you on your journey. Continue what you're doing. Did you know Did you know if, if we're doing what we ought to be doing, we can't be doing what we ought not be doing. Think about that. If I'm, if, if I'm doing what I should be doing, then there's no way I should be able to do what I'm not supposed to be doing. Can't be in two places at one time. You can't be loving God and loving money or the world at the same time. You can't. You've got to be doing what you're supposed to be doing. Do you, know, do you know why David got in so much trouble in the first place? He wasn't doing what he was supposed to be doing. Historically, in the Old Testament, when the nations went to battle, when countries went to battle, the king always went to battle to organize the battle, to control the battle. He would win victory or surrender. It was up to the king. In the scriptures, it tells us that David didn't go to this latest battle. They convinced him to stay home, so he, he agreed to not do what he was supposed to do, but do, do something else. So he stayed home. And when you read the scriptures really close, what he did was stayed in bed all day. He was binge watching something. I don't know. He was scarfing and just slumming. Just, just. It was all day because you read the scriptures. It says that in the evening, David rolled out of bed. He'd been there all day. He never even got out of bed. He just stayed there all day. I know some teenagers could probably do that for a week. And, you know, just stay in bed, go to the bathroom, go back to bed. But... David got up in the evening, walked out on his deck, looked off at the side of his deck and saw Bathsheba taking a bath. He wasn't where he was supposed to be. He wasn't doing what he was supposed to do. And he ended up with consequences. And he wrote about those consequences, the sin in his life, what was going on. And he, and he wrote about this and he pleaded to God and he cried out to God. And then God restored him to his rightful place in the relationship with God, that he was now, again, a child of God. I mean, you can read about it in Psalm 51, verse 12. Here's, here's his cry. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Lift me back up to where I was. Then I will teach transgressors your ways. I will tell everybody else what you just did for me. I will tell everybody. And sinners will return to you. People will start to respond to this. And people will see it in my life. And they'll know that you are who you are. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. O God of my salvation and my tongue will sing aloud. I won't whisper. I'll sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips. They're sealed shut by this image. Open my lips. My mouth will declare your praise. I'll not keep it a secret anymore. As a child of God... Assured of our salvation because the truth and accuracy of this book and God's love for us, when we do make a mistake, when we do sin because we will, it's just part of us who we are, we are cleansed when we come before God and we take ownership of our mistakes and we confess our mistakes to God, He will cleanse us and He will restore us with confidence so that we can sing God's praise, we can shout His glory, and we can tell the world and everybody else around us about the goodness and the love of God. So this is what happens when God works in the life of a believer. We make mistakes, yes. When it, what happens when a Christian sins? Everything. There's consequences. And there's cleansing. And it's that cleansing 
that gets us back to the place where we can sing. It brings us back to a place where we're clean and we can sing. See how cleansing does that? Cleansing. Now I'm clean. I can sing. I can praise God. I can lift his name and I can live for him. Not like other people. I'm a child of God. There's a difference. I have assurance of salvation. This is the way I'll live from this day forward. Let's pray. God, we're challenged by your word all the time, but then we're encouraged. We, just in this one, Psalm 51, we can read about the consequences of sin. And God, we, if, if we're honest and we read this, we say, yeah, I know. It, I remember it dirtied me. I felt terrible about it. And then I tried to hide it, but I couldn't. And it just started eating away at me. It started getting in my mind, and I couldn't shake it. It started eating away. I started, I started feeling depressed, and I started getting sick or just feeling sickly. And, and now I can't, I can't, I can't worship you. I just feel out of sorts and I feel out of fellowship with you. I just can't communicate anymore. And then now I can't even tell anybody about our relationship because I don't know if it's still true. But I believe your word. And when your word says I'm a child of God and that nothing can take me out of your hand, then as a child of God, I know you'll love me. Just show your mercy on me. I have that confidence. Even when I make a mistake, God, I'm going to admit it. I'm not going to hide it. I saw what that did. It just made me feel terrible. I'm just going to bring it to you and say, yes, I've messed up here, God. Please restore me to this right relationship. And cleanse me inside and out. Let me live a life that you designed for me, to live the life that you called me to live. It's so challenging in the world today. But I know I serve a God has this infinite grace for me. And because of that grace, I will worship you. I will sing your praise. I'll shout your name. I'll glorify you because you are the king of my heart. You're the Lord of my life. And I will do all I can to keep it just that way to draw closer to you. So God, I love you. I thank you. And I praise you for your love. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.